Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to first thank UUI for once again allowing me to speak about my experiences. When I spoke last summer about my time in Rwanda, which some of you may have been there, I was happy for the chance to personally reflect on my trip by speaking about it, but also to offer others a glimpse of a place difficult to imagine from within the heart of Indiana. My travels to Africa hold a special place in my heart, and I wish to speak today about my most recent and rewarding trip to the southern country of Botswana. I like talking about Africa because I think if more people knew what fellow human beings are going through, more would be happening to do something about it. Africa seems so far, so absolutely different that it's easy to write off, to go about our daily lives not thinking of those families, mothers, brothers, aunts, uncles, who live such different lives, but share with us that same basic humanness common amongst us all. My short time spent in various countries on the African continent has shown me both the vast differences, ones that encourage me to stretch and expand my views and lifestyle choices, and the infinite similarities that we too often overlook. So much gets lost in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives here in the U.S., which suddenly becomes illuminated when I take the time to slow down, to pause, and to really take the time to look and think. This summer, I spent four weeks in a small town in northern Botswana. Having never been to this part of Africa, Africa before, I went with my aunt, who'd spent significant time in Botswana in the 80s. My aunt, the sister of the U.S. president, I might add, <laughs> is an anthropologist at Long Island University in New York and has particular interest in fabric and dressmaking. In the 80s, she took multiple trips to various parts of Namibia and Botswana, but spent the most time with a family living in a rural town called Sahitwa. Two years ago, after 20 years away from Africa, my aunt returned to Sahitwa to find her host family again. Fearing that everyone might have died from the AIDS epidemic that wrecked the country in the late 80s and 90s, she spontaneously drove up to the town, asked the first person the first person, for her friend Regina, and was immediately directed to her old friend's homestead. Remarkably, no one in the family had died of AIDS, and she was able to reconnect with Regina and her old host family for a few days, promising to visit again soon. This past June, she finally returned and invited me with her. Thanks to my wonderful grandma and the help of you all at UUI, I was able to finance the trip and spent four weeks with my aunt and her Botswana family, studying the dresses and fabric art of the Herrera women in Sikitwa. My boyfriend Colin also joined us for a few days, which was a great opportunity for him too, as he got his first taste of Africa. Our host was my aunt's dear friend Regina, who lives in a compound filled with thorn trees, dirty sand, and myriad houses in various states of disrepair. On the day we arrived, my aunt Hildy and I set up our giant camping tent under one of the thorn trees off to the side of the compound, designating other nearby spots for our rustic camp kitchen and laundry line. We shared the compound with approximately 13 other people. The head of the house, Regina, is a woman remarkably like my host mom in Rwanda. Strong women both with large presence in size and character, these strong mothers single-handedly raise their entire households that are always bustling with little ones running around and which hardly have enough of anything to go around. Yet, the regal Regina always manages to look fantastic in her beautiful handmade dresses that brush the ground with their long and pleated layers and her carefully styled red curls. She cares for 12 children ranging from age six months, pictured here, to 22 years. Several are her own, plus the children of sisters, aunts, cousins, or perhaps even picked up from the side of the road. We never really knew entirely. All of the children respect her deeply and come running the second she calls, and we got to know them all very well during our stay. 
Two of the youngest were named Imbishita and Rani, ages three and four respectively. Regina, with her surprising sense of humor, called them the Big Two, after the well-known Big Five in the wildlife world. Fierce as lions and as troublesome as angry rhinos, these two lit up our days with their antics. <laughs> Unfortunately, their stories, like many of the other children's stories, aren't exactly light and funny. Ronnie's mother recently died, leaving four children motherless and prompting Regina to take in Ronnie, her sister's youngest son, as one of her own. He often had a blank look on his face, even when he would tease and coddle him. He simply didn't seem to quite understand what was going on and lived his life in a perpetual daze. Mishita's mother was 17 when she had her and didn't want the little girl. And Bishita calls Regina Ma and runs to her instead of her now 20-year-old mom. On the bright side, her young mom spends most of her days studying for her high school classes with dreams of going to university and becoming an archaeologist. But those dreams leave little room for three-year-old Mishita. So besides giving ample love to the abundance of underloved kids running around, Hildy and I spent most of our four weeks in Sahitwa sitting and waiting. For the recent college grad, whose days had been filled with the bustle of people and mad amounts of homework, and for my native New Yorker aunt, this slow pace could be really difficult sometimes. Some days we would spend the whole day in Regina's compound, only leaving to walk as far as the water tap just down the road or to pick up something at the store five minutes away. On those days, we would both nearly explode with boredom and jump at any excuse to do something. This meant that Hildy and I would often find ourselves willingly doing one of the many chores that in Sikitwa took hours to complete. One such chore was laundry. With no running water at the compound and the washing machine, a magical contraption only seen in American movies. The process could take up to two hours of hard work for a single load. The whole operation involved three buckets, water that has to be collected from the public tap, and lots of patient scrubbing. The first time I showed Colin how to wash his clothes, this is how he felt about it. <laughs> Not too heavy. <laughs> Washing your clothes is such a strenuous and time-consuming project, my aunt and I took to wearing our clothes as many times as possible, so as to save ourselves from having to wash them even despite the boredom. It wasn't like our bodies were ever very clean anyways, since bathing was just as arduous a process. Trying to bathe every day was pretty much impossible, especially since we had to time it right so that we weren't soaking wet in the breezy, cool hours of the day. With no running water and no bathroom, my aunt and I fashioned a makeshift shower room in an abandoned house at the back of Regina's property. We restacked a pile of neglected bricks to create a little washing table to hold our bucket and borrow soap. Water then again had to be collected from the public tap down the road in the huge several gallon jugs Regina had kept around at the compound. The water went on the fire to heat up and a while later it could finally be poured into a bucket and brought to our shower house for a chilly open air shower. Our bodies were never entirely covered in water all at once giving us an entirely new appreciation of having gallons of steamy water available back home at the turn of a tap. But an even more strenuous and time-consuming project was eating. We would pretty much stick to one large meal a day, since on most days we'd have around 15 mouths to feed. The sun set at 6 p.m. each evening, so we would start preparing our big meal at around 4. Regina is a phenomenal cook and her niece Tiny, the girl in the picture, at 11 years old was her aunt's sous chef. To me and Hildy's astonishment, Tiny could actually single-handedly cook the entire meal by herself on those days when Regina was too tired. This was after not eating all day and sitting through a day of classes taught in her second language, English. Cooking required a special firewood, which had to be collected with a huge, long pole from the tops of trees, and then enough matches from the store to get the fire actually going. 
The meat would go in the pot and cook for the, over the fire for hours, plus pounds of rice, steamed until the flashlight proved there wasn't any water left in the huge <laughs> cast iron mama pot. My aunt, the classic New Yorker, whose meals used to consist of a bagel grabbed from the street vendor and consumed in all of five minutes, would practically pull out her hair and pace the compound from all the waiting. Hours of fanning the fire and in many dirty pots later, we would all finally be able to eat the delicious meal using flashlights to light up our plates or Tupperware bowls or large cups filled with the yummy food. I gained a new appreciation for food and the whole cooking process on the day we were given a goat. A family friend named Zahimwa offered it Hildy and I one of the goats from his herd, a pretty major gift in a country where livestock is a measure of wealth and prosperity. Someone else before had already offered us a chicken, delivered to us in an old maize meal bag. I got all the kids in the compound to pose around our chicken in a bag with our thumbs up at the prospect of eating it. <laughs> Hildy, however, our resident Buddhist, was pretty appalled at the prospect of killing this poor living chicken, specifically for it to go into our bellies. The evening we got the chicken, it grew dark quickly, and we had forgotten how close to the tent we had left our little chicken in a bag. I accidentally tripped on it at least three times, probably, causing it to screech and my aunt to cringe every single time. My aunt later admitted to me that she had been hatching a secret plan to release the chicken. <laughs> over the poor thing, Regina's son took pity on it and threw it in the house until morning. And the next day, we did indeed have chicken for dinner. But the goat was an even bigger deal. It's a larger animal with a larger brain, not that I don't love chickens. The whole ordeal took up an entire day. Our farmer friend, Zahimwa, called up Regina and said, come pick up your goat. Our little four-door, two-wheel drive rental car wasn't going to get the job done. So we had another friend drive us out to the distant cattle post to pick up our meal. Upon arriving, it turns out that not just any goat can be ours. Zahimwa had selected a certain goat in particular to give to us, which his children had forgotten to keep tethered. So off they went into the bush to find our goat, emerging much, much later, dragging a bleeding goat through the sand by its horns. The men took over, tying its legs together and tossing it into the basin, into a basin in our trunk. The whole ride back to Regina's compound, the goat bounced along behind us, wide-eyed and filling the car with goat smell. In the car, Hilda tried her best to convince herself that goats don't have the brain power to recognize when their demise is approaching. The process of killing it, skinning it, and cutting it up took the rest of the day, a lot of skill, and a rethinking of my meat consumption. <laughs> I couldn't watch during the actual killing, remembering the goat's huge eyes as it got dragged into our trunk. We all know that each and every animal killed goes through this whole process, or an even less humane one, in order to fill the grocery store meat counters. But do we get the chance to pause and to actually contemplate that life every time we are eating our dinner? A life taken, sacrificed, in order to sustain another. <coughs> That's a pretty big deal. One that I couldn't entirely appreciate until I saw that goat. This is enough to make many a vegetarian, but not me. <laughs> I happily ate that goat, but was finally able to appreciate the value and significance of eating meat. Bellies full, the kids and I ended the evening with, re with what Regina called our goat dance. A dance I like to think was being offered to that goat for its generous belly-filling gift. The infinite waiting and patience were required to perform what we assume to be the simplest tasks, like eating, bathing, washing clothes, are all a part of the general lifestyle of many of the Herrero people we met. Their lives, and our lives for those four weeks, were filled with waiting for food, waiting for a friend to call, waiting for the heat of the day to cool off, waiting for water to heat. The pace of life slowed to a crawl, even manifested in the slow, meandering walk 
of many Herrera women as they passed through their daily lives. It was four weeks of seemingly empty days, difficult in their simplicity. The endless waiting reminded me of my time years ago when I passed through this church's coming of age program. As many of you know, the program culminates in a faith quest, an entire day spent by yourself in the middle of the woods with no food or distractions except the nature around you, meant to be a time of reflection and spiritual solitude. My sixth grade self plopped down in the middle of the woods during my faith quest and immediately asked the surrounding trees, so what is God anyways? The wind started blowing right at the end of my question. I happily concluded that my God is implicit in nature and sat the rest of the seven hours in absolutely desperate boredom, having already figured out life's big question. <laughs> Little did I realize in sixth grade, the lesson is often within the silence itself. It's been a challenge ever since those coming of age years to continually remind myself to take the time to pause and learn what the silence can offer. I think this is the idea of Quakerly silence as well. My college, Earlham, is a Quaker institution, and we start many activities, classes, convocations, the graduation ceremony, with a moment of silence. My sense of this practice as a UU is that it gives us all the time to pause in our lives and really be thoughtful, aware, and fully present in the moment. A Quaker woman on the internet told me that silence as an is an opportunity to leave space for the sound or the whisper of the spirit. To leave a space, she said, for the other to come in. Within the silence is not emptiness or a meaningless void, but a time to pause and find deeper meaning. My travels in Africa also offer a similar opportunity to pause and find deeper meaning in seemingly simplistic things. As the days in Sahit was slowly trudged by, I began to see a lot more within those empty days. Perhaps hand washing my clothes was not simply a meaningless task that took up way too much space in the day. Rather, what is the lesson in laundry? What can be gained from the bucket shower? How does seeing your meat alive before eating it change your perception of dinner? What many people saw as an impoverished, desperate lifestyle of the Herrera people in Sahitwa, I began to see as a life full of gratitude, respect, and infinite patience. The slow pace of life means that every person in this family has an insane ability to be patient while waiting hours to eat to appreciate where their food comes from and how much goes into its preparation, to take great care of their clothes and their few toys, and to improvise and create a meaningful life out of everything they do have. The children Regina raises are especially admirable, never once whining over the food offered for dinner, always finishing every last bite and licking their plates clean. They could wait for hours without uttering a peep while their mom worked a bit on snowing or chatted with neighbors. They showed their ingenuity by making every possible object lying around into a toy, using empty cans to make cars and bits of cloth to make dolls. Compare this to our video crazed and picky eating American children. What would it look like if more Americans were able to recall this kind of patience, this kind of respect and gratitude for what they have? More broadly, how can we begin to recognize the intense power and value of the ordinary inherent within the everyday occurrences of our day-to-day -day lives? Africa, for me, managed to, manages to push values to the forefront, to lay bare all the sanitized processes of living that we've forgotten to pay attention to. Every time I travel to Africa, I'm reminded of the intense power and value of the ordinary. In hand washing my clothes, in hauling water for cooking and bathing, and in waiting hours to eat the single meal of the day, my appreciation for life strengthened as I grew to recognize the amount of time, energy, and resources put into tasks I had always taken for granted. Coming back from Rwanda last year, I had similar feelings and would capture
catch myself almost wanting to put a bucket in my shower at home to at least be able to monitor how much water I was using to bathe. Having witnessed a goat dying to provide my body with protein, I am reminded of the many lives given each time I eat meat for dinner. I will also be infinitely grateful for my washing machine, since I'm absolutely the worst at scrubbing dirt out of my jeans. Regina and her family offered a powerful reminder of how I overlook so many important things in my life, and consequently don't pause to recognize and appreciate this life I live. My stay in Sahitwa left me asking, how often do we ignore the ordinary parts of our lives back home in the US? What values or lessons are we missing in our increasingly digitalized age? How can taking a second to pause offer a certain kind of enlightenment? This past semester at Earlham, I learned in my African anthropology class that studying the ordinary workings of everyday life can sometimes offer even more profound realizations about life than studying the horrific violence or intense love affairs that we so often turn to as definers of humanity. We talked about it in the class using the words of Jacques Derrida, who speaks of surviving as the ultimate manifestation of ordinary life. He describes the act of survival as, quote, life beyond life, life more than life, for survival is not only what remains, it is living the most intensely, end quote. Living the most intensely. Finding gratitude for food amidst perpetually not having enough to eat. Embracing patience when cooking for 15 people takes three hours and will be the only meal of the day. Learning flexibility when you can't bathe since there's no water at the public tap. Surviving those ordinary everyday processes that teach us patience, appreciation, and love of life that we too often undermine as unremarkable. Surviving as living the most intensely. When we all leave today and go out to Sunday brunch or back home for a light meal, let's consider what effort went into getting that food to our table. Let's consider those who aren't as fortunate as us and who can't afford to eat in the middle of the day as well as at the end. That first time there's a lull in, in the conversation around the table, let's consider not picking up our iPhones and jumping to fill the momentary boredom with another round of candy brush. When we get home to take a shower, let's remember how lucky we are to have fresh, clean water and take a moment to consider what it might be like to not have infinite water at our fingertips. Let's embrace the value of the ordinary, rejoice in the everyday, and revel in, what we, in that which we take for granted. And above all, let's strive to be aware, to be thoughtful and present, to live fully and immensely, and to situate our lives in the grander scheme of humanity. Let us pause, finding the lesson and the joy within that ordinary.